Listo. Ah, no. Yes. So, um, so we're changing topics now. Uh, there's, a, there's a theorem that we keep quoting that we would, we would like to know that it's true, but we have not proved it yet. And it's the following. Theorem given a Coxeter system by a group and generators um, with matrix M. We would like to say two things. The first thing is that the order of the product S, S prime is the number that you see in the matrix. By definition, we know that S, S prime to this power is the identity. We want to show that smaller powers do not give you the identity. And S is a minimal set of generators. In other words, if we, if we call S, S1 up to SR, then all of these guys are different in the group. So these are two, these are two theorems that I, I told you are true, and we would, we would like to use them very often. But we haven't proved them, and, and the reason is that we have to do something quite different. And I told you to trust me, but several people seem very worried about this. They cannot sleep at night because we haven't proved this theorem. So, so we're going to prove it today. That's, that's the plan. And uh, to do that, we're going to do some geometry. So the topic of today is the reflection representation of a Coxeter group. Okay. What's the idea? The idea is that we define a Coxeter group in an abstract way, but uh, I showed you already how you can see it as a group of signed permutations. Today, we want to think of a Coxeter group as a geometric thing. Okay. And uh, to do this, we should talk a little bit about the origin of Coxeter groups. Okay. So let's, let's talk about geometry for a little while. So imagine that you're living in, I don't know, let's say this is Rn. Okay. But all my pictures are going to be in R3. Okay. And we have some hyperplane. Okay. Hyperplane given by some equation. Um, hyperplane HS is, and is given by some equation which we can write as the dot product of BS and X is zero, okay? Where BS is the normal vector to the hyperplane, okay? So I want to talk about reflections, okay? What's a reflection? Well, what we do is, if, if we have a point x off the hyperplane, we reflect it orthogonally ac across the hyperplane. So the way of doing that, let me make it a little bit longer maybe, or shorter. The way you do that is that you find the orthogonal projector, projection, okay? And then, and then just double it. And this is going to be the reflection of x. Okay. Um, so reflection of Rs across a hyperplane Hs. Now what I would want, what I want to do now is write down a formula for this reflection. Okay. 
And this is a, an, an exercise in linear algebra. Let's, let's do it very quickly. Um, so let's, first of all, how do you project? Well, what we have to find here is, is some point, and the idea is that this vector right here is a multiple of, of Vs, right? Because it's, it's orthogonal. So let's call this guy maybe lambda Vs, OK? So if this is x and this is lambda Vs, then this point right here is x minus lambda Vs, OK? And we know that it's on the hyperplane, which means that if you take the part, dot product with Vs, we should be getting 0. Now we can easily solve for lambda and get that lambda is equal to x dot Vs divided by Vs dot Vs. Okay. So, so we have found the value of lambda for this projection. Okay. Now, if we want to find R s of x, then we have to take x and subtract this thing twice. So x minus twice lambda Vs. But we know what lambda is. Lambda is this thing right here. times Vs. So that is the formula for the reflection of x across hyperplane Hs. Okay? And you see this formula just depends on Vs, the normal vector, and on x, which is the thing that you plug in. Okay? So this you have seen at some point in your life, maybe in a slightly different language. Uh, why am I talking about this? Because what I would like to do now is thinking about not just one hyperplane, but having several hyperplanes. Okay? So, so let's say that we have our hyperplanes in R n. Okay? A good example to keep in mind is the example that I talked about in the first day of class when I was talking about my little nephew. You know when nephew? Nephew is Sorino. So, <laughs> So my little nephew was playing with mirrors, and I was telling you that he really likes playing with 60 degrees. Okay? Now, this is really a three-dimensional picture, right? Because mirrors really are these flat things that are walking out of the board. And so you should think that, that here's the little boy, and here are two hyperplanes. And when he's looking at himself in the mirror, what he's doing is really considering the reflection across this hyperplane. So when I talk about this, you should, you should think about this picture. This is H1, this is H2, and it's a three-dimensional picture. This is an R3. In general, we can just have some number of hyperplanes. Uh, each one of them defines a reflection. Okay. And uh, what, I, what I told you when we saw this is that the reflections R1 and R2, in this case, generated six, six images of my nephew. And the group that was generated was the symmetric group S3. I want to think about doing this in general. I have a way of, of composing R1 up to R sub R. And I'm, I want to make a group out of them by just saying the product of two reflections is first reflect across one and then reflect across the other. Okay. So. So let's talk about, uh, so we're going to think about the group generated by these reflections. Okay. Now, I want to point out some things to you. First of all, these guys generate, right? This is the way I'm defining it. This is the group generated by them. And they are of order two, because if you reflect and you reflect again, then you get back to where you started. Okay. Now, let's think about R, I, R, J. What happens when you ref reflect across one hyperplane and reflect across another one? Many of you did this in your homework for the Dahedral group. 
And you saw that if you take one reflection and another reflection, what you get is a rotation. Okay? And this is a, a, a nice exercise in linear algebra. It's not only true in, in two dimensions, but in any number of dimensions. When you compose, you, you reflect across one hyperplane and across the other one, what you're doing is rotating rotation by some angle And that angle was the angle between the hyperplanes. Or if you prefer, I mean, what, what's the angle between two hyperplanes? Well, you can think about it in, in, in different ways. But for example, you can think that each hyperplane has a normal vector. And that defines the angle. We, we can just talk about, you know. Just like, just like here, we have the angle between two planes. It's just this 60 degree angle. Okay? This is the angle between hi and hj. And I forget now if we had to divide by 2 or multiply by 2. Do you remember? Divide by 2? Multiply. That's right. What does this mean? When we do rirj, we're just doing a rotation. Now. You can imagine from what I'm writing that I'm thinking about Coxeter groups here. And I would like to know, when is R, I, R, J raised to some power the identity? What's the number that I can put here? Well, basically, whenever I do R, I, R, J, I get a rotation. And so what I have to figure out is how many times I have to rotate to get back to where I started. So this is Mij, where Mij is the smallest uh, positive integer for which, when I do alpha Ij, Mij times. I get a multiple of 2 pi so that, I, so that I get to where I started. Multiple of 2 pi. OK? I just keep rotating until I get back to the start. Now, it could be that this Mij doesn't exist. Because it could be that alpha Ij is not 2 pi divided by some rational, some integer, by some rational number. So if there is no. no such integer mij, then we're just going to declare that this is infinity. Because the point is that, for example, if you rotate by pi root 2, then you're going to get pi root 2, 2 pi root 2, 3 pi root 2. That's never going to be a multiple of pi, of 2 pi, because of the root 2 that is irrational. Okay? So this could be infinite if there is no mij. Okay. And so what I'm looking at here is something that looks very much like a Coxeter group. Okay. And, and I can do this for any set of reflections and build this, build this thing. Okay. Any questions about this so far, the geometry? So, so I'm talking about geometry, but now what I would like to do and the goal of this reflection representation, the goal will be to think of any Coxeter group, any Coxeter group, as a group of reflections. Now, I don't know if this sounds to you like a reasonable goal or if it sounds to you like a crazy goal to, to think that I can build any Coxeter group in this geometric way. To me, this sounds absolutely crazy, but it, but it turns out that, that you can do it. The only thing is that we have to, we have to be a little flexible with what reflections means. Okay? So, um, we just need to allow more general reflections. 
So I'll show you how to do this. Basically, what I, what I want to say is the reflection that I was talking about here is an orthogonal reflection. And I want to maybe not have to stay orthogonal. So I want to allow myself to reflect, except that I don't reflect orthogonally. I reflect at an angle. So when I talk about these reflections, I mean these reflections that are reflections, but at an angle. I'll, I'll show you a good picture in a second. Okay. So, so that's my goal. My goal is to show you that any Coxeter group you can think of geometrically. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm given WS. Somehow I have to, I mean, this is, this is algebraic data. Somehow I have to invent the space, invent hyperplanes, invent reflections. I have to invent everything. So what's the, well, let's, let's, let's give a name to these guys. Okay. Let's say that I have R generators in my group. And let's say that my matrix is M, I, J. Okay? So this is, this is the only data that I have. And out of this data, I have to make a geometric picture. So first, I have to tell you what vector space we're going to do this in. So let B be a vector space with bases. Basically, we want to do it in, in an R-dimensional space. Okay. I'll do it abstractly, but if you want, you can think about this as R to the R. Okay. So that's the vector space where I'm going to live. Okay. But then what I'm going to do is, and you've seen in linear algebra that the, the dot product is a very nice bilinear form, or an inner product, but we can define different bilinear forms. Okay. And that's what I'm going to do. Even though E1 up to ER are a basis, they're not going to be an orthonormal basis. They're going to be something a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is define an inner product where the inner product is going to be that EI, you should think of this as, as like dot, except that this is not the dot product. The inner product of EI and EJ is going to be minus cosine of pi over Mij. Okay. It's a little bit strange. We'll, we'll see why this, this is the definition that we want to make. But I'm just defining some inner product. Okay. Now, if I want to then define what's the inner product of U and B, then what do I do? Well, what I do is I write U in terms of my basis. I write V in terms of my basis. And then I just perform this dot product. So this is a bilinear form. And so what I get is, I guess, sum of over I, J of alpha I, beta j minus cosine of pi over mij. Okay. Now, in the, in the usual dot product, you just have alpha i, beta i, and nothing. In this inner product, we just get a more complicated thing. Okay. But so this is just a way of defining an inner product. And uh, let me, let me notice a couple of things. If, what do I get if Mij is infinity? Well, strictly speaking, this is not defined. But if I forced you to define it, then you might say, well, pi over infinity is 0. And uh, so cosine of 0 is 1. So negative one. Now, of course, this is not a proof. What I'm going to do is say this is, I make it this if Mij is finite. I make it negative one if Mij is infinite. Okay. Another thing that I would like you to notice 
is that what's the inner product of EI and EJ? Sorry, EI and EI. It's minus cosine of MII, but we know that in any Coxeter matrix, the diagonal has ones or twos? Ones. Thank you. <laughs> so pi over one is pi. So what I get is one. Okay. So even though this is not an orthonormal basis, at least each one of the guys, each one of the unit vectors, I mean, each one of the basis vectors is a unit vector. It has length one according to this very strange way of measuring length. Okay. So given this, I want to define my reflections. What I'm going to do is that each one of the SIs is going to become, I want to think of it as a reflection, right? Each one of these guys I want to think about geometrically. So let's make our reflection. Let me tell you how to go from generator SI to a reflection RI, okay? And this is where I basically let me, let me talk about this in two ways. Um, first, let's look at this formula right here. Okay. What I want to do is basically define it in exactly this way. So I want to define my reflection in exactly this way, except that now I don't have dot product. Instead of dot product, I have my strange inner product. But this is basically what I want to define my reflection to be. Okay. So ri of x is going to be x minus twice. Now the dot product becomes x dot, no, x comma vs. No, vi, sorry. Now, I divide by vi comma vi, which is what I see there, and then vi. One nice thing about this is that, sorry, I meant E instead of V, right? So this is an E, these are E's, and this is an E. And then one, one nice feature of this definition is that this denominator is one, okay? EI comma EI is one, and so this is not really here. Let me just forget about it, okay? I'll erase it. So this is what I'm going to call the reflection, okay? Now, this is the formula, but what, how are you supposed to think about this? Well, maybe you just wanna think about it as some reflection. But it's a nice reflection, you'll see, because what I'm doing here, let's, let's think about this geometrically. I want to draw that same picture, but now, over here, um, what I want to think about is that, I mean, when is, when is ri of x equal to x? What are the fixed points of this thing that I'm calling a reflection? You see, ri of x is going to equal x when this is zero, right? So let me, let me call that x comma ei equals zero, this is, this is some hyperplane. Okay? This is really just a, a, a linear space defined by a linear equation. Okay? And so this is going to be my hyperplane hi. Okay? And my reflection leaves all of these guys alone. It doesn't touch them, okay? which, which is like reflections are. Now the difference is that this is not an orthogonal reflection. So if I want to figure out what the reflection of x is, I'm not going to take the orthogonal projection anymore according to what we think of as orthogonal over there. It's just going to be some, some skew thing that'll be basically the same thing, but at an angle. Okay. One way that you might think about this is 
I don't know, it looks something like this. If you want to reflect a B that looks like this. Can you tell what it looks like? It's then it, it kind of reflects like this. And it goes, becomes something that looks like this. Okay. So it's not, a, it's not an orthogonal reflection in that it doesn't end up over here and with the correct shape. It kind of goes along this direction. And so, and so this is, this is kind of a, a picture of what these reflections look like. Okay? They're kind of like reflections, except that they're off at an angle a little bit. Okay? Any questions about that? Let me... Let me also write this in, in terms of a matrix. What does R of I do to a matrix that looks like x1 dot 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 up to xr? Well, you should be thinking that here I'm writing x into, the, these, are, these are the coordinates in the basis E1 up to ER, okay? So I'm thinking that x is the summation of xi, ei, okay? So what does the reflection i do? Well, if you see what it does, it basically just leaves x alone, and it only changes the ei coordinate. Yeah? It doesn't change any other coordinate of x. So ri of x is going to have exactly the same coordinates as x, except in coordinate ei. So that means that if i is right here, then r of i is going to leave everything alone except for coordinate i, is, it's going to change, and then everything else is going to leave alone. Okay. So it looks like this. Okay. Now what happens? To coordinate i, well, basically, I just have to take into account this, th this thing right here. Okay. And... Um, When you do it, you get this. You get minus 2 cosine of pi over m1i up to minus 2 cosine of pi over, I should write this bigger, minus 2 cosine pi over mni. It's just a matter of unraveling the definitions. You, you just look at how I defined it, you plug in, and this is what you're going to get. That the entries in row i are just these minus two cosine of pi over the m's. Okay? Now what's, and everything else is zero. Zero, 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 zero. Okay? The reason I'm doing this is that I want you to think of this also algebraically. If you think about this, R i is just some linear transformation. Okay. R i takes this vector and it just performs this linear transformation to it. And, uh, and it does something, some linear thing. Okay. Linear. So, so let's step back a little bit and think about what it is that we're doing. We have these generators S1 up to SR, and we want to represent them as geometric operators R1 up to R sub R. And I'm telling you that this guy, this linear transformation of, of the space, 
is supposed to represent generator SI. Okay. Now, what do I have to check to make sure that this really represents my group? So, idea is that these are I's represent the S I's. Now, to check that that's true, basically I have to make sure that, that the same relations that SI has, these strange linear operations also have them, okay? So, what do, I, what do I have to check? Well, basically what I have to check is the Coxeter relations. Which I denote it like this. Now, what does this mean? Well, you can think of Ri as some matrix, Rj as some matrix. Then you do Ri, Rj, Ri, Rj, Ri, Rj. And what you're doing is multiplying a bunch of matrices and you're supposed to get the identity. Okay? This should be the identity. ¿Una pregunta? No? ¿Seguro? So let's, let's perform this computation. Let me show you why, why these linear operators satisfy these, these properties. Okay. We have, to, we have to get our hands dirty and do this computation. I mean, this is, this is not something that you can just get for free. We really have to do this computation somehow. And the way that I'm going to do it really is just by, by this matrix representation. I'm actually going to multiply these matrices together. I know that sounds crazy, but we'll, we'll do it. And uh, these matrices are not too bad to multiply because they're almost the identity. Yeah. And because they're almost the identity, uh, the product is also almost the identity. First, let me multiply Ri and Rj. What is that going to do? Let me make a lot of space for this. So, you multiply basically this matrix times the same matrix, except that this happens in, in row J. Now, you just do this. And and it's not so bad because, like I said, almost everything is the identity. The only things that are going to happen are in row i and in row j. Everything else, you just get the identity. So here's row i, here's row j, here's column i, here's column j. Okay. And when you go ahead and multiply this, you're going to find that outside of these guys, it's just the identity. And the only interesting thing happens at these four entries, okay. which is good news. This means this, this is not going to be very hard at all. Okay. Now, you should do it. And what you're going to get, it's, it's, it's very easy to check. You just have to get your hands dirty. What you get is something that looks like this. You're going to get this. two by two matrix that's interesting, and everything else is just the identity, okay? And this is really row I, row J, column I, column J, and what C? C is, I mean, you can imagine, it's, it's just this, this cosine thing, okay? C is the cosine of pi over Mij. That's what I get when I, multiply my matrices Ri and Rj, okay? Everything else is zero. Now, if you think about it, this is very good news. This is very good news because that means that what happens when you now start 
Let's think about this in two ways, geometrically and algebraically. What do you prefer first? Geometrically. What are we doing here geometrically? Geometrically, we're saying leave every coordinate alone except for the i and j coordinates. And so what that means is that the only place where this is doing something is in the i, j plane. Okay? This is something that has r dimensions, but I'm only touching the i-th coordinate and the j-th coordinate. And that means that I'm only doing things to a two-dimensional thing, and the r minus two-dimensional complement of that is not being touched at all. Now, you can see that in the picture that I raised of my little nephew. Even though we live in three dimensions, all the action takes place in a two-dimensional thing, and then there's this one dimension where nothing is happening. And this is exactly what happens here. In two dimensions, there's something happening. Nothing else happens. And so what we have here is just a two-dimensional linear transformation, and we understand two-dimensional linear transformations very well. They're either, uh, they're either reflections or rotations or compositions of these things. And that means that geometrically, this is, this is more complicated than this. This is not bad. Okay. Algebraically, you just multiply, and you see that when you raise this to any power, only the i-th and j-th coordinates are going to matter, and in the rest, you're going to get the diagonal. Okay. So in the end, what I need to check is that when I raise this power, this matrix, to the mij, I get the identity. Okay? You know, I only have to pay attention to what happens in this two-dimensional thing. So I have to check that minus 1 plus 4 cosine squared, 2c minus 2c and minus 1. When I raise this to the mij, I get the identity matrix. And this, this can't be that hard. I mean, this is the, these are two by two matrices. How do you, so this is maybe a good reminder of, of things that you maybe learned several years ago and do not remember. How do you raise a, pow, a matrix to a power? I should ask whoever's taking linear algebra right now. So what do you do? You, you better diagonalize it first. Because if you, if you want to multiply these things together, just getting your hands dirty is going to take very long. It's a mess. If you diagonalize it, then all of a sudden multiplying them is very easy. Diagonalizing is basically the same thing as finding the eigenvalues. Okay? So we should just find the eigenvalues of this matrix. And uh, well, that's a computation that it's a two by two matrix. You can do it, right? So the eigenvalues of this matrix, I'll tell you what they are. The eigenvalues of this matrix are, they look like this. You'll be very happy to see this answer. You compute them. That's the answer that you get. Okay. This is e to the plus or minus 2 pi i over m i j. Why is this excellent news? This is excellent news because what is this matrix? This matrix is exactly the matrix that rotates by 2 pi over m i j. Yeah? So, I mean, the point is that we can rewrite this matrix as you can diagonalize it, which means you change bases, and in your new bases, your matrix is just rotating by the angle 2 pi over m i j. So this matrix, this operation, r i j is just rotation by 2 pi over m i j in this guy's because you might need to change bases to see that okay maybe it, maybe it doesn't do exactly that but if you look at it in the right basis it does exactly that so after a change of basis
and then we're basically done because I'm saying I'm rotating by 2 pi over mij, mij times. Okay? And that means not only did I prove that this equality is true, but I also proved that mij is the smallest one for which this is true. Right? The first time you're going to hit 2 pi is at mij. So what I proved is that the order of ri, rj, is exactly mij. Not only is this true, but the, the order is the correct one. I, I have, that's a very good point. I have not, so the, the, the question is how do I know that there aren't any more relations? And I don't know that yet. Right? I, the only thing I have proved is that there are these relations, that this is the exact order, but there could be other relations between these linear operations. And I have no idea, and you can imagine it's very hard to check because you don't want to start multiplying matrices here and looking for relations. Yeah. But, uh, but at least I know this. This is definitely true, right? And this you might see as good news, and you might see where I'm going, because if you see what I'm trying to prove here, it's exactly that statement, but not for the geometric guy, but for the Coxeter group. Okay. So, so this is very important, but now we have to tie it back together to W. What does this say about W? Because this guy, for all we know, this is not even a Coxeter group. I haven't proved that it's a Coxeter group. Okay. But what have I proved? I have I have a function that takes my I mean the I have a function that takes a generator of my Coxeter group and sends it to some linear transformation. Okay? I know that these guys satisfy the Coxeter relations. So I have this. I know that these guys satisfy the Coxeter relations. And that, and that means we know something. We don't know that this is a Coxeter group. The only thing we know is that because these relations are satisfied, we have a homomorphism from W to this guy. That's this universal property of Coxeter groups. Okay? So this means we have, so this extends uniquely. I mean, this was your homework problem, right? This extends uniquely to a homomorphism from my Coxeter group W into where do these guys live? These guys are linear transformations. And so what I have here is just the, the group of invertible linear transformations, which you may or may not know the name for. Group of linear transformations of, of B. If you don't know what this means, it means that group of linear transformations. group of linear transformations and once once you pick a basis you can you can think of these as the invertible matrices invertible r by r matrices okay that's all i know i don't know anything else I don't know if this seems to you like a very strong statement or a very weak statement, but I'm going to show it to you just how useful this is. And the way I'm going to show you that this is very useful is by proving this theorem that if you have tried to prove it, you realize that this theorem is very hard to prove algebraically. 
Honestly, I, I don't know how to prove this algebraically, but we're going to prove it using this reflection representation. So let's prove, let's prove this theorem. Proof of theorem. Let's prove A. Okay. Let me, just to be consistent, because I call S, S1 up to SR, let me change this to SI as J. And this to SI comma SJ. We need to prove that the order of SI as J is exactly this thing and not something smaller. So let's assume that SI as J raised to some other power is the identity. Okay? Well, what happens? I, I only know one thing, which is that I can map this equation into an equation for the general linear group. So I apply C to this equation, and what do I get? I get that the reflection R I times the reflection Rj to the kth power is phi of the identity is the identity matrix, or the identity transformation. And then that's it. Right? That's it because the order of Ri, Rj is Mij. It's not something smaller. And so this is a contradiction. I don't know about you. I think this is an amazing proof. And especially it's an amazing construction. And, and now you see why we have to define this inner product the way you have to define it, just because then you just prove this theorem um, immediately. I mean, there's nothing else to do. How do you prove B? Jose proved it on the discussion board already. Suppose SI is equal to SJ. Then let me just multiply them together, and I'm going to get the identity, right? Because they're the same thing, and they're, I mean, the identity is SI squared, which is SI SJ. And that means that SI SJ has order 1. But we know, and, and really, by part A, we know that the order is the number that you see on the matrix. Okay, so the number that you see on the matrix is one, and we know that in the in the matrix you can only have ones on the diagonal. You're not allowed to have ones not on the diagonal. That means I is equal to J. So, so I hope you like this this geometric way of thinking about this. I. It's, it's a little bit inconvenient because, I mean, I, I saw your faces when I started defining this, and you think, man, these, these, upper, these linear operations are horrible. They just take some getting used to, but, but once you're used to them, really proofs sometimes become very easy for things that seem very hard and that really are very hard otherwise. Now, I should say that, that historically, the way, the way the, the, this subject developed is that people were studying reflection groups first, and then I think it was Coxeter who realized that reflection groups are Coxeter groups, and that's when they became the same field. But so this construction that I'm making here might seem very arbitrary, but really I'm just saying what you do for real reflection groups, just imitate it for arbitrary reflection groups. Okay? And I mean, if, if you wanted to not do it geometrically, but, but do it with real reflection groups, you would have the same computations. And so I'm not doing anything strange here, except generalizing what I see in the geometric picture and generalizing to, to this picture where now any Coxeter group I can think of as really living inside GLB. So I can think of it as geometric operations, linear transformations on B. Okay. Any questions? Which representation? The Reflection? No, it's, it's definitely not unique. And let me give you a proof that it's not unique. What did we just do for W equals S? Actually, that's not a proof. I thought I had a proof for you, but maybe I, I don't just yet. But um, I heard that, that there's a 
representation theory seminar happening in Los Andes. Yeah? No? Some people are saying yes, not many. So if you don't know what representation theory means, it means exactly this. Re representation theory means you want to study a group by mapping it to the general linear group. That's what representation theory is about. And so the question that you're asking me is, is there a unique representation for W? And the answer is definitely not. The answer is that, the answer is that that's a very interesting question that you should uh, take a lot of effort to understand. Actually, that's a very good uh, project for the, for the course. If someone is, take, is taking the representation theory course uh, to understand this, this is really nice. So then the, the question is which, which of these things can actually live in Rn? So I can really do this in Euclidean geometry. And uh, that's also a very nice answer that we, a, a very nice question that I think we will get to answer. There's a complete classification of the nice groups that you can, that you can realize in Euclidean space or the nice ones that you can realize in hyperbolic space, for example. Uh, there are very nice answers to, the, to those questions and, and it's a hard question. So the question is, when I didn't do this abstractly, but I talked about real reflections, is that always a Coxeter group? The answer is no, because, for example, I mean, it's, it's the same issue. If you, if you take these three mirrors, and you consider the reflections, the three reflections, there's relations between these three reflections. And so it becomes the same issue that we keep running into, are there additional relations or not? And in this case, there are. In this case, we know that we only need these two reflections to generate the third one, and, and that happens also geometrically. Okay. okay, I think we should stop there.